Okay. Good afternoon. Um, let me the first five minutes repeat what we have discussed the last uh, in the last morning, the yesterday morning. Uh, so at first we have start why we are interesting in, uh, in fracture mechanic of, of small samples. Uh, there are two main reasons. One is industrial development, so which more driven uh, part, which is the miniaturization of components down to the micron and nanometer region, yes, uh, in the microelectronic sensor technique and medicine. The other one comes from the material point of view to understand really local properties of materials. So then we, we look, this is a typical example in, in the electronic industry of failure. Then we discuss the different type of, uh, of tests which are now available, so even down to 200 nanometers, so this is a human hair, it is on the sun, the sun is quite dark. That is how we can machine the samples we have discussed. Uh, how. And then we uh, looked, especially since even in uh, standard fracture mechanic, we always have to, to look what we measure. All these values are really material specific or sample size specific. And this is even more important when we go to this small scale. And the reason what, or why we looked here, especially to the stress strain approach of fracture mechanics, because it is very easy to see the different uh, uh, sizes which are involved in the fracture process. So we have seen, okay, what is important is, is the size of the uh, K-dominated region, yes, uh, or if small-scale yielding uh, can be applied, and this size is important in relation always to the size of the fracture um, uh, process zone. When uh, small scale yielding is important, then also the size of the plastic zone is important. And when we come to full scale yielding, then the size of the HRS uh, field, the Hutchins, Rice, and Rosenberg field in a relation to uh, the fracture process so is the important length scale parameter. In order to obtain uh, size, uh, size independent or size dependent, uh, so to see one of the important thing is what we have seen is that for example the size of the K dominated region is a certain portion for if the crack length is small compared to all the other dimensions, is about what tenth to about two tenths of the crack length. Then the uh, near field uh, uh, solutions are quite good approximation. Okay. So then we said, okay, in principle, when we go to this small dimension, or in principle, we have to do this also in, in the macro fracture mechanic, but. In especially if we look, what we can do is very helpful to divide, to distinguish between ideal brittle, ductile material, and the semi brittle material. Because the size of the fracture process zone is so different. Yes. In the case of ideal brittle is always in the border of nanometer, yes, one or two nanometers, not significantly larger. Uh, in the case of semi brittle material, the size can vary. In some cases, it is really in the same order of magnitude than ideal brittle. Uh, then it is in the order of nanometer, but it can also be in the order of meter. And then what we do in microsamples is always uh, a size dependent and structure dependent uh, properties. And the case of, in the case of ductile fracture, Ductile fracture in terms of, uh, of material science, consideration of ductility that we have a, a planting formation of pores and coalescence of the pores. In this case, also the size of the fracture process zone can vary between 
few nanometers and few hundred microns. That's really large because the, these are three, four orders of magnitudes. Four orders of magnitudes are really large. In some cases, we are here. In some cases, there. Okay, we looked here today for some examples for semi printed materials. Then, <coughs> what we always have, especially in micro, uh, in, uh, when we perform fractured mechanic tests on the micro scale, how large our sample is in relation to uh, the microstructure, uh, the characteristic uh, dimensions of the microstructure and characteristic dimension of the microstructure can be grain size, spacing of uh, precipitation, uh, cell structure in heavily deformed material, and in well uh, uh, recrystallized uh, single crystals of micro samples, semi brittle case, often dislocations are important. And, the spacing of the dislocations. Then we look to uh, ideal brittle uh, materials. There are really a lot of ideal brittle materials, oh, or nearly ideal brittle materials, which are used in, um, in specialized functional material in, in different sensor techniques or, or electronic devices. So it is important also to know uh, the the ductility, fracture toughness of these nearly ideal brittle materials, or sometimes especially uh, interfaces, are also often uh, nearly ideal brittle. Yes, especially in this, uh, the, the interfaces between uh, certain functional material and uh, some uh, some structural support materials. Or when you look, for example, to hard coatings on on, uh, on hard metals, yes, they are more or less ideal brittle, yes. And to understand the the damage tolerance of these materials, uh, the size of these coatings are always in the in the micron dimensions, or sometimes only in the nanometer dimension, in order to understand the fracture behavior. We can use fracture mechanic, but in order to determine the uh, fracture resistance, uh, in the, the, the use of fracture mechanic is in this case quite simple. You can use it like in macro, but the determination is, of, is not so easy. There are two main reasons. There is how to generate really an ideal pre-crack in a micron sample, and the other one is if we really generate such a crack, is this really on the plan where we have the lowest fracture resistance? This was a short consideration what happens, or what is the limit for the application of a simple K dominated zone so, uh, K uh, approach for ideal brittle material that we have seen, okay. We can use this approximately up, for up to crack length of about 10 to 20 nanometers because then the fracture process zone is about equal to the K uh, or, or is somewhat smaller than the K dominated zone. Okay, if it is not, then we are more or less at the ideal, uh, or very near to the, uh, the ideal strength. Then we discuss shortly uh, the notch problem in this ideal brittle and how we can overcome. In this case, we have uh, looked at some examples. <coughs> okay. Then, but when we then come to uh, ductile material, and ductile material on the micro scale is a really difficult topic. It's not difficult, I would not say from the fracture mechanic, but from the mechanical properties of the material itself. And for this case, we have to think about two things. The one is the really atomistic process of deformation. It is usually dislocation motion, or in some case, it is also twinning, which can be, which is more or less uh, a combination of, 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 of 
movement uh, of a group of uh, partial dislocation. But we have looked how this works. And, but in principle, we have seen, in principle, we can describe these plastic plasticity, this, great, uh, this uh, dislocation plasticity, by the discrete movement of this location. However, this is only possible on volume size of few nanometer. Otherwise, you, the numbers of the involved dislocation is too large. You cannot treat it. But you have only to go to this dislocation mechanics if the volume which you consider is in the order of the magnitude of the mean spacing of the dislocation. Yes. If it is larger, then the mean space, if the volume which you consider is significantly larger than the mean space of the dislocation, then you can use classical Mises plasticity, maybe with some size dependence, gradient plasticity or something else, or, uh, or crystal plasticity, to describe the this. We have then discussed a bit uh, uh, the dislocation corrective interaction. What when we look especially to the nanometer scale, it is important to know that the real stresses in a material are, can be really extremely high. Okay. They can be extremely high near the corrective, and they can be extreme, they are also extremely high near the dislocation. That's simply because these defects have their singularities. Corrective has their singularity. And even in the case of plastic deformation, we have these singularities. We should this have this always take into account because if we have, even in micro sample, when you deform a material, uh, the, the fracture at the grain boundary or the inclusion do not occur because there is a stress of a few hundred megapascal. The reason for the decohesion is that there really are few dislocations there and this dislocation induces stresses in the order of the theoretical strength, which is two orders of magnitude higher, and they causes the decohesion. That's, that's important. But when we go to the, this micron sample size, we sometimes have to take into account this discrete nature of plasticity in order to understand what happened. OK, then I have shortly discussed how we can treat this uh, discrete dislocation mechanics. Then I give a short introduction to the size effect of plasticity. There are conferences now about this, this, uh, this uh, problem uh, of size effect in plasticity. Uh, and, but I have tried to give you a, a short overview uh, that for the the plastics, the, the strength or, or the, the flow stress of a material become here in terms of hardness simply by indentation can really vary over uh, nearly one order of magnitude when you change the, the size of your volume from uh, a few hundred microns to down to a few nanometers. That's in principle, all these size effects are the tricks which uh, material science use to change the yield stress of our material. We change, for example, grain size. We change the spacing of inclusions. That's exactly the same problem what we have then when we, our dimensions of our uh, samples or the dimensions of our component come also in the same size region. So, there are similarities always between this design of materials and design of components in these dimensions. Okay, then we talk about this, for example, this pillar test, this tension test. And what is, let us go back here, this is an important foil. <coughs> we show that there is no unique description for this size effect. There, this size effect depends on many things. For example, if you make a bending test, if you make a, or here the bending test, this is a tension test on a short, uh, or this is a compression test, this is a, 
tension test. This is a tension test with a, a reduced uh, uh, gauge length. And so it, the, the size effect is very is, is strongly dependent on the constraint of the deformation. If we have a, bo a boundary on, uh, on one side of, of your sample, or we have a free uh, surfaces on uh, um, our sample, or if a, uh, our sample is connected, for example, to a, 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 a pure elastic material, like when, if you give a, a copper on a, a silicon, yes? Then you have a plastic material on a, uh, on a more or less linear elastic material. And then we have, and if you have on top an additional uh, uh, hard coating, it behaves completely different or to uh, the case where the copper has a free surface. And you have to take into account this if you look then to thermal fatigue or to crack initiation. Then we looked how we can do this, and so this is a when we go to simply uh, understand when the structural size uh, is small compared to the dimension, then our flow stress is size independent. When we come into the region, for example, for the grain size, we can get a, a, a decrease in strength. And when the uh, sample size then becomes smaller, then we get, we get a significant, usually a significant increase in strength. So then we discussed a bit about uh, the, the size effect when we have a, a ductile material. In principle, as long as the uh, uh, the fracture process zone is small compared uh, small compared to uh, the, the sample dimension. As long can we expect that we get uh, some uh, really size independent uh, uh, fracture parameters? like a toughness for crack initiation, like in the classical G delta A curve. Uh, but when our fracture process zone, which is typically uh, coming to the order of the specimen dimension, which is this case, uh, then we usually uh, obtain uh, a size dependence uh, of dependent on crack length, uh, dependent on uh, uh, ligament width and thickness dependence. And in all these things, we have to take uh, to to look how the fracture resistance change if we really want to predict what happens. Okay. So then we look to one example. It's a nanolamella uh, material where we really get some bit strange effect recently that the, in principle the cr critical crack tip opening displacement was not affected by the thickness which is usually not the case in macro samples but this is simply due to the special structure and only when the sample thickness becomes, comes in the order of the in this case, it was a uh, silver, a ductile silver layer between a metallic glass layer. When, the, when we would further reduce the thickness of the sample, we would further decrease uh, the, the toughness. That's a very simple rule that, for example, the critically cracked tip opening displacement cannot be, or it will not be significantly larger than the thickness of the sample. And if your thickness comes into the order of few nanometers, then uh, your crack tip opening displacement of your ductile material will never be significantly larger than the thickness of your metallic film. And therefore, 
the fracture toughness will decrease. And this is also the case for all ductile material. In the usual textbook about fracture mechanics, you only see this part of the curve. Yes. This increase, in most cases, they only measure this region. Yes. But if, you're, if you look to foils, for example, aluminum foils, yes? In aluminum foils, you are somewhere here, yes? And if you go further, then you come even down. If you would further decrease the thickness of your foil, you would further decrease uh, the fracture toughness. OK. Now, this was the end of first day yesterday morning. Now I'm going to show that in some cases, even on the micro, on micro dimension, in ductile material, or well, this is a, a mixture of ductile and semi-brittle behavior. It is ductile in the typical loading direction. And it is semi-brittle uh, for the splitting of the, uh, of the wire. And this is a very old material cold drawn palytic wires. They are used for suspension bridges. Uh, these are, are, it is really bad. <laughs> Fever, excuse me. <laughs> so this is 1900, this is uh, 1990, I think, yes, or 2000, I, mean, yes. I think it is 2000, yes. Uh, so this quite old material, it is uh, about Seven, between 7 and 8, 0.7 uh, uh, and 0.8 percent uh, carbon steel. Uh, the, uh, the development of this steel for suspension bridges you see here, and it's further increased now, I think, to about 2 gigapascal. In parallel, for suspension bridges, you use rel relative thick wires in the order of uh, three to four millimeters, whereas for uh, the, the steel cord of, of ties, you use very th thin uh, wires, dimensions of uh, 100 mi uh, micron or below. And in this case, so they, this, the beginning is not really shown, but it shows in principle an increase in the in the strength up to this is unfortunately you can also not read this is four four gigapascal uh, or here you see a typical uh, summary of different steel types for pianos wires uh, and also for the steel cord wires which goes up to five gigapascal and industrially used uh, now steels up to four point five five gigapascal. Yeah? It's really enormous. I think you know, it's usually surprisingly not, not known in, by most of the material scientists. Uh, we have, or at least even, even for this, in the steel community, it is not so well known. Uh, the reason for these uh, uh, enormous increases in this perlitic steel, you have usually this arrangement of cementite and in between you have ferrite. The undeformed uh, perlitic steel has typical, uh, if you simply uh, perform it from the, uh, or generate the steel bar uh, or the wire from simple heat treatment from the austenitization and then slowly cooling down, forming the perlite, you have this, this spacing is about 200 nanometers, yes? Or one hundred between one hundred and two hundred nanometer spacing between the cementite uh, platelets, and in between you have a ferrite. With the deformation here, this the first one is shown here for about a, a strain of two. This is would approximately correspond to yield strength of two point eight gigapascal. It's more than all the spring steels you use usually. Yes. <coughs> uh, then the spacing is about uh, uh, 20 to 30 nanometers. And you further uh, draw this uh, material, you 
during the deformation, you align this microstructure, and then uh, you refine the spacing between the, the cementites. And then when you go to this very fine, you can end up here about with 10, and here below, this is the highest uh, degree which recently, or about seven, eight years ago, uh, Japanese guys have received, they have a spacing here in between of about uh, five to, to 10 nanometers, the largest are 10 nanometers. This has a strength of seven gigapascal. It's the strongest material you have on Earth. Yes. <coughs> it is the simple steel, yes. And now we have looked what's the reason that we can use such a material. And we can bend it, yes. Uh, so and the, the surface of these uh, of these wires, they they are really not polished. They have a lot of defects. Why does these wires do not fracture? And therefore, we measured fracture toughness uh, on, on these wires. You can see here one, this is the highest strength material with, uh, with about 7 gigapascal, with a diameter of about 20 microns. So Yes, a human hair would be this dimension. Yes, this is approximately the wire, huh? uh, size of the wire. It's a quarter of, of a human hair. And then, in order to measure also the fracture toughness in this direction, yes, we simply machine here, you can see here, the small lamella. And then on this small lamella, we make a small uh, Beam, which has a pre-crack of few uh, of, of somewhat less than, than one micro. And then we tested this here in bending, and this was quite simple. We make a notch and then a fine uh, pre-crack with, with, a, uh, with a focus iron beam. Okay? So now let us look to the load displacement curve. And we have done this for, yes, for these two types. This is a, a steel with a strength slightly below 4 gigapascal. It's really high, yes. Uh, if you always take into account, a good spring steel has about 2 megapascal, uh, two, 2 gigapascal. So 2 gigapascal, and this has about 4 gigapascal. And this is the highest strength with nearly 7 gigapascal. So this. So when you now look, okay, so we really get even some plasticity in this re really deep notched sample with a strength which is higher than or similar to a carbon fiber, yes, and uh, even uh, the hard metals. Only, only ultra fine or uh, nearly nano crystalline hard metals are stronger than than, than these steels. So they are comparable to, to the strength of, of this finer fine. Here you see a nearly linear elastic behavior, and but what happens here is that the material do not fracture here along this plane. You get the crack deflection. So the values which we determine here are only lower bounds. The real fracture toughness value for if you would make here some side grooves, they would be even higher. Mm -hmm. So it is only the fracture toughness for, for these kinked behaviors. And here you see a fracture toughness, this four, uh, four gigapascal wire uh, with about 40. This is higher then the fracture toughness of the undeformed material, which has a strength of below one, one gigapascal. So what's the reason now for this enormous ductility in this 
an enormous high strength material. And that's quite easy to see what happens. Here you can see the pre crack. This was the rough pre crack, and this is the very tiny, fine uh, notch at the, at the notch root of this large notch. What happens is we get the delamination. Because, let us okay, maybe go back. This is such an extreme fine lamellar structure, and the, the crack is grown in, in, in this plant, or in this case. So, and what we get is a delamination of these, uh, of, the, of the microstructure. So, you can see, and then we get the more or less tactile behavior of the uh, region in between. You can see this here, and also here. The delamination and especially a very strong crack deflection. Uh, if you don't measure really the load displacement that would calculate the stress intensity factor, and you have no way to measure the load, if you have a ductile material, a very simple way to measure the fracture uh, toughness is to measure the crack deep opening displacement. Yes. We have in our institute a special technique where we simply uh, determine the, the 3D structure of the, of the fracture surface of exactly opposite regions. This is exactly the opposite region. If you look here, this is the fracture surface. This was the pre crack. This is the, the fracture surface. And this is exactly, if you put this on this side, you would see. This, uh, uh, this is exactly the opposite side from this. And then one can simply cut, uh, determine by stereo images the 3D shape along a line, or you can also try to put the whole 3D model together in the computer. But we usually do it only on the line. And then you can see, OK, what happened here is we had at first the planting then we had some pore formation, and then we had further to decrease. And if we calculate from this corrective open displacement the fracture toughness value, we come to a fracture toughness of, uh, of about 40, which is very similar to what we obtain from uh, the uh, low displacement curve. And this is really a lower bound for always for the, because this was necessary before the first extension of few nanometer takes place. <coughs> okay. So and in this case, the wire has 20 microns about. So the crack tip opening displacement is really smaller than the wire diameter. So it is really a material property because the fracture process zone, which is about one micron, the fracture process zone is smaller than uh, the K dominated region, and also uh, it is smaller than the HRR field. So it is really useful to use this. So, uh, but then we also looked to uh, the fracture toughness value for the splitting of the wire. You see this. Okay, we have made this bending experiment, you see this here the next part. And in this case, the fracture toughness is really quite low. What we usually would expect for, for such a high strength material is only five, about five gigapascal here for the four, uh, uh, five uh, megapascal times square root of meter, and here we have about four uh, megapascal times square root, square root of meter for this 7 gigapascal wire. And the reason is quite clear. We have a more or less semi brittle fracture of, along the extreme aligned lamella, which have a thickness of, yes, in this case, the lamellas have a thickness of a uh, few nanometer, yes, few between 5 and 10, and in this case, between 15 and 20 nanometers. So in, we have here a semi-brittle fracture process with a fracture process zone 
in the order again of, of some in the order of microns. Uh, so the measured fracture toughness values are again really material specific values. In this case of a semi brittle, in the other case of a ductile. So this was the ductile region, this is the semi brittle. Even in the, this micro <coughs> region. Uh, we have also looked, this is on the in, the same microstructure can you also generate not only by wire drawing but also by rolling. But with rolling, the, the lamellas are arranged nearly perfectly in a plane. And then when you arrange it perfectly in a plane, you see here these very tiny lamellas. Yes, again, it's uh, about 20 nanometer thick, and the strength of this material is about four, maybe somewhat less than four, four gigapascal. You see again, nearly no planting, only this semi-brittle fracture behavior with about four megapascal times square root of meter. And in the wire, where you have this, this rough fracture surface with about five so, so what, uh, to, in order to see how are these materials are in relation to all our other materials, usually have. Here, this is the stress intensity, the critical stress intensity factor, the threat, uh, the, the fracture toughness value, as a function of the yield stress for different class of materials. These are typical aluminum alloys, these are titanium alloys, uh, uh, these, uh, these are high strength, these are only high strength steels, yes. Uh, typically for really extreme high strength application. Uh, and uh, what you clearly see when you increase the strength, you get usually a decrease in fracture toughness. If you look here for the other steels, which we have, uh, the, the typical steels, they are more laying in this area. Some of them really come above 150 megapascal square root of it. So when we now plot all the, the standard material then delay this blue area. And these cold draw balitic wire, they opens a complete new area. So in this field. And the why do this they do this is a very simple is a very simple explanation for this behavior. Uh, because it, it, it lives mainly from the anisotropy of uh, the fracture toughness. In a plant strain case, you know, we have already discussed this, the stress in front of the crack, uh, the volume element very near to the crack tip in the plastic zone, is about three times the yield stress. If you take a hardening, it can go up to about three to four times the uh, the yield stress of the material. Uh, if you have a material which has a strength of one third of the theoretical strength, and you would have these three times higher increase in front of the yield stress, you would overcome the theoretical strength, so it must fracture. Yes. You cannot get an isotropic material with a strength equal to uh, or, or larger than one third of the theoretical strength simply from this consideration. But when we have this delamination, then we transfer the plant strain situation in front of the crack to a plant stress situation. And this reduces the maximum stress from three times the yield stress to the yield stress. And that's the reason why we could really generate such a good ductile in this high strength. So if we now summarize, we now summarize what we have seen. Uh, for ductile material, the usual structural material like the typical aluminum alloys which are used uh, for 
in the airplane industry, so high, uh, high strength aluminum alloys, they have typically cracked the opening displacement in the order of 20 microns. If you look to uh, high performance steels, then they have typical order of 10 to 100 micron only the very soft materials have then also cracked the opening displacement of uh, a significant larger than 100 micron, maybe <coughs> half a millimeter or a millimeter. And if you have really uh, sufficient size of your sample, in the case of a 100 micron, you need several centimeter thick uh, samples. You get typically these behavior in ductile material. And but when you produce samples, even from this material with dimensions in the order of microns, then the fracture toughness can really fall down. And they can fall down uh, significantly below the fracture toughness of uh, the plant strain case. So even if you are in the plant stress case, you will not reach the fracture toughness value of the plant strain case due to the limitation in the deformation in front of the crack because the sample size is thinner than the crack deep opening displacement in plant strain. Okay. The semi-brittle, in semi-brittle material, we have in principle always a kind of brittle uh, uh, decohesion, simply uh, separation of the atoms. In ductile material, we have simply a forming process. Yes. We have the, the pores, the pores grow by a forming process, crack plants by a forming process, and finally the neck and fra uh, fracture is not really breaking up of atom, it is simply inductive material forming process. But in, in brittle material, is really a, a breaking of atomic bonds. And in semi-brittle, we have also this, this process of breaking of atomic bonds. But oh, we have also plasticity involved in this process. Hence, huh? this can be location motion, twinning, and sometimes we have also a significant amount of breaching. We have this seen in the example of what I have shown for uh, titanium aluminum. So this part delivers additional uh, or requires additional energy for crack propagation. And this part can be, especially in, the, in micro dimension, size dependent. Yes. So the size dependence in semi brittle material is usually much more pronounced than in ductile material. Except the example which I have shown before, for example for the splitting of the uh, the, uh, the semi uh, this uh, cold drawn paralytic wires. <coughs> so uh, what we always have to take also into account is uh, the structure, the structural dimension when we go to the micro, to micro samples. And uh, the fracture process zone is usually in the semi brittle material somehow related to the microstructural size. If the microstructural size, like in concrete, yes, you have large stones, and uh, so it, the fracture process zone is maybe 10 to 100 times uh, of these larger structural element which we have in our concrete material. And uh, the same happens for all other materials too, like also for ceramics or uh, the different uh, functional materials. And in order to, full, to really get a uh, uh, material specific property, uh, the difference between a size dependent and the material specific is that independent of the size, we get always the same toughness value. 
But this is often not the case when our sample size is too small. Then we get always the material and size dependent behavior. And sometimes it also then depends locally on the structure of, uh, uh, of the material. It depends where, where the crack is located. Is the crack located at the interface or at the brittle material? Uh, so with micro samples, we often have to take into account the size dependence in the semi brittle material. But we can use these microsamples in order to understand uh, the, the fracture process of this semi-brittle material. And because there, these microsamples allow, for example, to measure the fracture resistance of interfaces, what controls the generation of cracks at interfaces. Is the semi-brittle process, we, we can look then to the semi-brittle process in these microsamples and compare them to these with microsample and look uh, if the processes are equal or different. Uh, there are, we can also look to the intrinsic ductility of, of uh, materials. Sometimes when we have a semi-brittle material, we have a crack path, but we do not know the intrinsic ductility of the different faces because the crack always try to find the, the way with the lowest resistance. And this allows then also to look to the in, uh, different, uh, the individual faces. So I will show some of the questions which we actually try to solve in our group is, uh, when we look to this semi-brittle behavior of metallic materials, uh, and in all PCC metals, iron, the, the PCC iron, uh, molybdenum, tungsten, uh, uh, vanadium, uh, uh, fail at low temperature in a brittle mode, and they always show a ductile to brittle transition. It's uh, also, the, most of the intermetallics, if you look to uh, titanium aluminate uh, or to uh, iron aluminate and all, all these types of materials which are in consideration for, for application, they fail below uh, uh, te a certain temperature in a, a semi-brittle mode. And in some of these materials, we have a crack extension more or less directly from the crack tip. And in some materials, we have a crack generation. We have a planting. For example, this is very common in steel. We get the planting, and then we have a brittle generation of the crack in front of the crack. And in principle, there is not known why this happened. The engineers have found some master curves to treat the problem simply in order they have to design components, yes? But they have not understood why this happened. And uh, <clears throat> in order to, to develop new material where to, re uh, to, uh, to shift the ductile to brittle transition temperature to lower values, it is necessary to understand why this happened. Uh, at very high temperature, you have the typical, in mo all these PCC metals, the very ductile behavior that you get. This planting continues, then you form again a uh, uh, pore in front, the pore growth, and there is a coalesced sense. There is a ductile. This is a semi brittle, which where again you form a crack here in front. Uh, when we look then to this, change of fracture toughness here. I have plotted this in terms of the corrective opening displacement, but you can also critical corrective opening displacement. You can also plot this in terms of, of tough, uh, fracture toughness K on C. Then we often, in these PCC metals, we have often such a behavior that 
critical corrective opening displacement slightly increase and then continuously go to a higher value and then we are in the upper shelf region. This is the lower shelf region. On the contrary, there are some materials which shows, for example, silicon is such an uh, example where you have nearly ideal brittle behavior up to 400 degrees of five, four, five hundred degrees centigrade, and then the, it jumps to quite high values. In reality, this high value is, is not really ideal brittle. It is very often also a semi-brittle process, but you have really a, a really uh, jump function of the crab cake. In order to understand this behavior, these small sample techniques are very helpful. Since in the semi-brittle case, you always have some plasticity, and then it is very helpful, these micro samples, because you can change the stress field. I will see that you will see this in the next few uh, figures, in, uh, in the next few uh, slides, maybe more in detail. Uh, what you also see, Sometimes in the material, especially in the intermetallics, you have not only the generation of, uh, of dislocation, you have also some collective uh, emission of, of partial dislocation. There's a special type. It's not a full dislocation. But this can make then a twinning of the, of the crystal. This is a typical example. And how this twinning effect, and why this twinning stops at a certain amount, uh, 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 loading and then the crack uh, propagate is in principle not known till now. So and now I want to show, I've seen, tried to show before some mechanism what happens during the semi-brittle process. And now we'll try to show what can we do with these micro samples. If we perform a tension experiment, fracture mechanic tension experiment and the dislocation generates from the crack tip. What happens in a, uh, in, when we look to a long crack? When we look to a long crack, the, the typical friction stress is here. The first dislocation moves if there, is, there are no boundaries. It moves to the uh, as long as the stress is larger than the, the, the stress field given by the K-dominated region. But then it stops. Plasticity cannot be, the dislocation cannot move here out because the stresses are too small. When we go now to short cracks, the dislocation can move out, can out move away from the crack tip. So we have a possibility to cause plastic deformation at the crack tip and change the arrangement of dislocation here in this tensor septum. Even more, uh, uh, larger difference can we can generate when we go to bending, example, uh, bending uh, uh, fracture mechanic samples. Here you see again the, the shear stress in a, in a thicker bending sample, and this is the shear stress here in a thinner tension sample. If we apply <coughs> the same K value, it means that very near the th crack tip, we have the same stress field. Yes. When we have the same, apply it in a, without plastic deformation, when, the, uh, when we apply the same K, it is the same stress field. But you can clearly see in the large sample the, the dislocation can move to really large distances. It may be within the K-dominated region, but in the small sample, the crack, the dislocation will only move near the neutral axis and not further. And if we further reduce, it really will the dislocation will stay even nearer to the crack tip. And so we have a lot of possibilities to change the 
arrangement of the dislocation without changing our microstructure. And can now look how these changes of the arrangement of dislocation changes our fracture resistance of the material. And this, I think this will allow in the next few years to understand this semi-brittle fracture behavior of the PCC metals. So here is again this comparison of this banding sample, where you have this change of the of the shear stress at the neutral axis in front of the sample, and where you have the limitation, or where you can limit your plastic deformation to extreme small region. region. In tension sample, you can go to complete full plastic deformation, so the dislocation can run out of the sample. So that's really the extreme values. This is here for one of the examples. Unfortunately, the video is not running. <coughs> um, we have a, this is a transmission electron microscope image. You see this is only yes, 300 nanometer. Yes, it's really tiny. Uh, here, this is a very tiny, uh, one of the sharpest uh, notches we ever generated. These are generated with an electron beam. And <coughs> there is here this location which is generated in chromium. And then, when we further load, the dislocation runs away. And after a certain amount of strain, it fractured itself. Uh, and uh, one really can look what this location arrangement really causes then the final fracture of the material. Okay, so the semi-brittle material is really difficult area, also in the small scale, uh, in, in, in micro samples, but the semi-brittle area is also not understood in reality in our micro samples. Yes. We, do not, we simply measure the values in most cases, we do not really understand the processes behind. And the microsamples will allow, I think, to solve many of these unsolved questions. OK, now with them, I want to, to close the things about uh, static fracture. I will talk about uh, somewhat about fatigue, because in most cases, our failure is not induced by uh, static loading. Our failure, in most cases, is caused by fatigue load. And this is especially when we look to metallic component in electronic devices or in, uh, in, in, uh, in sensor, in microsensors, then they are typically failed by fatigue. Uh, so in 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 the case of ideal brittle material, we usually have no fatigue. There are some exceptions, which are that because uh, if you have ideal brittle material, then you have no plasticity, and then you have, in principle, no fatigue. But sometimes you have some effects of environment that you load up, and during this cyclic loading, you generate more oxides on the, uh, uh, on the fracture surface, and these oxides may cause some batching and crack can grow. There is a, a discussion if this really may happen, but it seems that on a small components uh, in ideal brittle material may cause also uh, uh, some, or there exists some uh, fatigue phenomena, but these are not, uh, to my opinion, more an environment effect induced uh, than uh, or in, in, induced uh, phenomena than really uh, fracture, fracture phenomena. Okay, so therefore we have no list here, not listed here the ideal particles. In ductile material, the uh, the uh, process of fatigue crack propagation is quite simple. In reality, if we load up our material, we usually plant our crack. 
we form new air, new fracture surface, simply by the planting process. It is a pure forming process. Then we unload, we resharpen the crack, and in the unloaded state, it is usually closed the crack. If you perform it at constant load amplitude, the crack is always closed. Yes? It always more or less atomistically sharp. Maybe there's a layer of an oxid layer in between. That's all. Okay, the cyclic crack tip opening displacement varies between not really 0.1, maybe 0.2, because that's the smallest value which are possible. Is the burger, the lattice spacing cannot go. You generate smaller plastic deformation than your lattice spacing. Uh, up to 100 microns in the most ductile material, like, uh, like in austenitic steels, there we really could generate also really blunt, corrective blunting of few hundred microns and crack uh, crack rate, which is then in the same order of magnitude about 10, 10 to 50 uh, microns per second. So, but when we are in the near threshold region, then we have always this size, this fracture, uh, this size of the fracture process. So this indicates in micro samples at the smallest the loading case, in the smallest loading case, the fracture process zone will always be smaller than all the other dimensions. So in principle, a fracture mechanic approach should be possible. Maybe the only problem is that our, the description of the plasticity in this, in this area, because what should we use as, uh, as the flow stress of the material, or uh, the, uh, what are the, uh, the limits for the movement of the dislocation? But nevertheless, so for if we have micro samples, it, we can never generate such high uh, uh, cyclic corrective opening displacement because this is larger than uh, our sample. So we are usually only can see the T crack propagation, which are small compared to. Uh, the, the or corrective opening displacement, which are small compared to the dimension of your sample. Uh, or otherwise, one have always an extreme size dependence. In, in thin films, this may be sometimes possible. I may look, maybe I have at the end a uh, picture of them. And the other one is the semi brittle, and the semi brittle fracture process in fatigue can be again very similar to the ductile one, but it can be the fracture process zone can be extremely large. I can again an example of coke. Okay, but at first before we talk about crack propagation in these dimensions, let me show some things what happens under pure fatigue loading. And we can now also do this experiment, you see here kind of bending beam. And uh, we can now, you see that, yes, the dimensions are, uh, are microns. In this case, I think four microns. And now, you can look how we do this. We have here a gripper. Does it work? Yes. So you simply bend it for a And you can really look what happens there. Now, you can look to the generation of, of surface steps, you can look to the uh, formation of, of structures, and so on. Okay, so what happens? This is typically behavior of what we see in these micro, uh, uh, micro beams. In principle, very similar if you look to the fatigue behavior on the, uh, on the micro scale. If you look in the scanning electron microscope uh, on the grain scale to uh, what happens on the surface, you form some, uh, some surface steps. Uh, and these are 
quite similar what we know also from macro experiments. The only difference, what you clearly can see, this occurs here only in this highly stressed region. And you clearly can see the dislocation which are generated here. They do not move above, uh, below the, the neutral axis. Yes, they cannot move below. So they are piled up. And, and so we have a cyclic deformation here in this area. And the, the surface damage or surface roughness, it is not really a crack. But in the early state, it is only a roughening of the surface, which is more or less the same in micro samples as in uh, macro samples. Uh, here you can see there is also no, not really a significant difference or a significant effect of the, of the sample size. This is, for example, a, was a 8 micron uh, thick uh, beam, and this is a 2 micron thick beam. The blight, yes, the blight strain is here, some, or some the cyclic plastic surface strain was the same in bo uh, both cases. The only here is somewhat larger, but you can also see that the roughening is significantly larger here in the, uh, due to the larger numbers of cyclics. Uh, interesting, you may know what happens in, 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 in Kappa, for example, a typical fatigue loading. In fatigue loading, uh, we form this, the dislocation from cell structures, as what you see here, for example. And this also happened in the near surface region of these eight microns uh, samples. The cell, the, it's not really visible. This, the size of these cells are in the order of somewhat less than one micron. So do you have about three cells in, in the near surface region, which are developed. Uh, in the uh, smaller samples, no cells are generated because the size is simply too small to form these dislocation cells. In macroscopic uh, kappa samples, you form a cell structure, and this cell structure usually become, un become unstable, and you form these so-called persistent slip bands. And you get usually a crack initiation in kappa on these persistent slip bands. Also in nickel, you have also this, this phenomenon. Uh, this does not happen in the, in the microsample because you don't form these uh, persistent slip bands, but nevertheless, the, the, these surface roughness grows, and up on a certain value, uh, then the, ah, uh, that's another, you will see this later, we form also cracks, and this crack grows in a, uh, in a similar way as in, the, uh, in, in macroscopic single crystals. Okay. There are several defects especially in the electronic industry, uh, the, the maximum size of, of the metallic uh, grain structure which you have is typically the, the, the thickness of the film which you apply, the maximum size. But for, in order to increase the strength of the material, they often try to reduce the grain size. Furthermore, because you know with decreasing grain size, yield stress increases, and therefore you can re the strain is given simply often by the thermal strains from the, uh, the heating up of the electronic device, uh, the devices during the operation, and so they want to have higher, uh, uh, high strength metallic material, and therefore they reduce uh, the grain size very often. But what happens is that when you cyclic these very fine grains, you also change the grain structure, the grain growth during this cyclic uh, loading and softens during the cyclic loading. And this is also very simple to do this, for example, on such material. This is a single crystal, but if you do this on a nanocrystalline or ultra-fine grain material, 
you can simply look in the scanning electron microscope how the individual grain grows. You can then look what, are, what recipe you can uh, apply to avoid this growing of the grains. And here you have seen one typical example. This is a grain, a crack which is grown in a grain, in a, in a nanocrystalline material, and then this crack grows in principle in, in this ultra-fine grain, predominantly along uh, the grain boundary, but with the same mechanism as a typical long crack. So um, what are now the driving forces for crack propagation for such extreme small cracks? If someone works in the field of fatigue, uh, there are a large uh, or fast amount of studies related to the so-called short crack effects. The short crack effects mean, or it has been introduced by, or in the, the mid-70s, they have found if they look to cracks in, in uh, uh, typical fatigue samples that the, the crack growth rate in these samples is higher than the crack growth rate which we determine on standard uh, fracture mechanics samples with long cracks. And there was a really big discussion in the, the 80s and 90s. And even today, there are not really a, a complete agreement in the, in the fatigue community. But uh, to my opinion, if you divide the different types of short cracks, then it is uh, more or less uh, uh, understandable uh, if we simply look, if we divide the different mechanisms which affect fatigue crack propagation, and there are two things. One is what happens really at the crack tip during the loading, and what are the, the separation uh, process during this loading uh, process. These are called the intrinsic pro, uh, fatigue mechanism. And then we have different mechanisms like the fracture surface contact, the crack deflection, which changed also the driving force at the crack tip, or especially the, the, the fracture surface contact, uh, uh, also affect the driving force if the, during the only half of the load amplitude the crack is open, this crack grows uh, slow, uh, slower than if the crack is open during the whole load up, that's quite simple. And if we take this into account, then I think the description is, uh, is uh, of short cracks becomes more uniform. And I will show you what happens here. And in this case, it is not really a micro sample, but it is a micro crack in a micro sample. Again, this was one of the first experiments which we have done in uh, studying the short crack effect on a low cycle fatigue experiment. This is a typical macro sample with one times one or two times two millimeter, uh, no, one times one millimeter dimension. Then we have a notch, a notch with the dimensions of about 10 to 20 microns different samples. In this case, this is 10 microns. And then we look to the, unfortunately, the biggest. You should see here very nice stretches. I think you will see this then on this uh, foils, which you will, will get. Uh, and we have really nice fatigue crack propagation here. And here, since we have done this also in the scanning electron microscope at extreme high uh, uh, low cycle fatigue uh, strains. So we have applied strains here of about uh, a cyclic plastic strain of, uh, that's, is that what I'm going to say the wrong? It is, even the very small thing here is better to see. Uh, the two micro <laughs> these are uh, uh, two uh, 
2% plastic strain, <coughs> so strain amplitude of uh, yes, somewhat more than, than 4. And here, the scale is about 2 microns. So you see, this is at maximum load. Then we unload. In the low cycle fatigue experiment, you have more or less elastic unloading. Therefore, this enormous plastic deformation is not really significantly reduced. It's completely different to small scale yielding. In small scale yielding, we will have a closure of the crack even here. But in the large, uh, uh, low cycle fatigue, the crack is even open in the unloaded state. We see then we, when we are at the strain of nearly zero, then again we see, okay, the crack is significantly reduced, uh, plastically back deformed. And here, at the stage C, the crack is really closed. You see this also remain closed during this area here. Crack is closed during this air, uh, loading state, and then if we load further, it remains closed up about to the uh, um, uh, to zero load, and then the crack starts to open, and planting occur uh, again. And what you clearly see, oh, that's really too much can only clearly see on this computer. Here, this is, there is a small marker. This marker is now here. And the crack advanced is exactly this demand, this distance. It is about one quarter of the crack tip opening displacement. And that's very characteristic for really very ductile material. Uh, so this was before. If we now look to this intrinsic process, the intrinsic process is simply this planting process, and resharpening process. And we do not look here to this part. If we plot now this crack tip opening displacement, which is identical since the crack is always closed at the minimum load, yes, even in this low cycle fatigue experiment, yes, in constant amplitude loading. Constant strain amplitude loading. It's not the case in variable amplitude loading because it's quite easy to understand. If you would change the load, the loading direction here, to uh, or if you yes change the loading direction here, the crack will not be closed. And in the next sample, if you go here to this uh, uh, strain amplitude, it will close again. But in constant amplitude, it is always closed. Or what is important is if we look here to the corrective opening displacement, which is more or less cyclic, is identical with the cyclic corrective opening displacement. Here, for different crack lengths, and here the crack growth rate. And what you clearly can see, there is a clear relation that the crack growth rate in this austenitic steel is about a quarter of the crack tip opening displacement. It's simply planting, resharpening, and the new surface are generated, uh, partly contribute to the crack propagation. And this happens in each cycle. This is a typical ductal phenomenon. I have also plotted here a result which we have obtained from a really large sample with 50 millimeter in or with uh, 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 crack length. Oh, that was yes. The, the crack length was really really large. In this case, there were really big samples, uh, and this shows the crack tip again with this stereo technique, really the 3D shape, and this is the low cycle fatigue experiment and crack length here was 30 microns here it was 
uh, 30 millimeters, so it is uh, three orders of magnitude larger. The only difference is the applied, uh, the applied uh, strain or the applied plastic strain. Here, the far field plastic strain is nearly zero because it was a pure linear elastic loading uh, from uh, or pure small scale loading, loading, and therefore you could use the, uh, the standard fracture mechanic estimation of crack growth, of deep opening displacement, growth rate. And, uh, it is not so surprising that, but uh, it, it is, uh, are in good agreement. Uh, but what you clearly see at the same crack, cyclic crack deep opening displacement, the crack growth rate is exactly the same. So that's independent of, uh, of the size of, uh, of the crack and also independent of the dimensions of your sample. And this should also hold down to the micron scale. Yes, we see this here. So the other part, this extrinsic mechanism, this closure phenomena, which are really taken, takes place, for example, in, in this case. The, the closure value, the, the crack closes in this case at about 25% of the maximum load amplitude. In this case, in all these cases, the crack closes far in the compressor <coughs> region. It's completely different, but the crack growth rate is solely controlled by the cyclic crack dip opening displacement. And the same can be also transferred to micro uh, uh, dimensions, yes. Okay. Uh, so as long as, as a consequence of, of this analysis, as long as the crack length and the ligament width and the sample thickness is more than 20 times the corrective opening displacement, there should this relation between crack growth rate and delta C2D should be more or less size independent. <coughs> so it can, we can also transfer these to micro samples. And it, the, this should then only be material and environment specific, yes? If, the, uh, if you change the environment, the relation between this CTOD and crack growth rate may be different, yes? But for, it is only for, for one environment, it should be characteristic. I will show you one example. This is again now such micro sample. This is again a micro beam, what you similar have, have seen before in these kappa samples. The dimensions again are three microns. That's our typical sample which we produce with the FIP, yes, because larger samples are more difficult to produce with FIP because then the time for machining becomes too large. Uh, this is again now this politic steel with about three gigapascal strength. And you see a crack is generated grow through the material. We have now measured the crack growth rate, about six nanometer uh, per cycle. Uh, simply, in, you see here the crack length as a function of number of cycles, and you simply can determine here the crack growth rate. That's uh, quite easy. But you can also measure here the crack the crack deep opening displacement. Yes. And uh, now take this crack deep opening displacement and calculate a corresponding stre uh, stress intensity range which would be necessary to cause uh, such crack deep opening displacement in a macro sample. Then this crack growth rate would be here. And this is uh, and this is the crack growth rate determined on macro samples. It, it is really the same crack growth rate. Just to be repeating, how long does it take to uh, 
the, the production, the simply the, the, the machining, yeah. it is one day long. Maybe if you, are, if you use this needle technique, you may be eight hours if you make this. Uh, you have to, if, in case if you have to remove more material, it may be sometimes two days, that's, but that's the maximum. Okay, so but it is it clearly shows that in terms of cracked opening displacement, the fatigue crack growth rate as long uh, as long as this relation is approximately fulfilled uh, can be described by simple the standard fracture mechanic tool. The only problem what we have. Usually, when we do, uh, when we look to fatigue crack propagation in uh, uh, la, uh, to fatigue crack propagation under low, low cycle fatigue condition, is that we use the G integral, and in the G, the the relation between the G integral and the crack tip opening displacement is simply coupled with the yield stress. And when the yield stress of the material becomes size dependent, then we, can, we are, have some, some problem with the recalculation of the data. In this case, in this case it was quite easy. We have this nano lamellar structure, and we have no size dependence of plasticity in this case, because the microstructural size is significantly smaller than our dimension, and therefore we have no size effect. But in electronic devices, where the, the crystal size may be, uh, is equal to uh, the, the film thickness or the interlayer thickness, then we have always the size dependence of the, the flow behavior. And this may cause some problems. We have to determine the size dependence. But then we can again use our classical rules between COD and G. Oh, so then <coughs> this is what I want to say about the fatigue behavior. Now, let me come to another thing which is also related to the, uh, the strength of material or the strength uh, controlling uh, features of material. It is the intrinsic strength and intrinsic ductility of material. Um, I will show you here first an example. This is uh, ultra fine grain uh, nickel. Unfortunately, you cannot see. This is one micron. Uh, this is uh, the, the grain. The colors correspond to, to different grains. The different colors give also uh, the orientation of the grains. That's not so important. And here you see this is now. A millimeter, yes. And what you should see here, this in the detail you can approximately see, it is a typical ductile fracture behavior. And that's very often the case in, in nearly all of our uh, ductile materials that we see this dimple structure. And this is even a relative high purity grain uh, nickel. Nevertheless, you see that we here have some. Uh, some larger dimples, and these larger dimples, you find some tiny inclusions. And the question is now, is the ductility now mainly determined by these tiny inclusions, or you see also here some very small dimples. These dimples are generated, these are related to the size of the, of the grain, and these dimples are mainly they develop simply intrinsically in the material since, uh, uh, yes, on the grain boundary or the triple junctions, on some of these triple junctions, pores develop and grows. Another question is, are these uh, inclusions to control uh, the, duct the uh, ductility or 
the, the, the intrinsic grain size controls. So this was the one millimeter sample which you have seen before, the, the ductal fracture surface with these large inclusions. And, but you have seen these large inclusions. Uh, this, this is one micro. So if you would generate a sample with only two or three microns, then the probability to find the inclusion inside would be zero. That's exactly what we have done here. <coughs> you see, this is the macro experiment. This is a, yes, typical stress strain curve of this type of material. This is a simple necking process of this material. You have seen this a strong necking phenomena, and then it fractured. A cup of cone, a cup of cone. When we look now to the micro sample, where well, we, we have not these inclusions, where we have only the, the crystal structure, we have again about 10 grains over the thickness. So it is really a long game. But we have no inclusions inside. So what we get is we get nearly like a single crystal behavior, complete necking to zero dimension. That's also for other things. Uh, this is now for different grain sizes. Another example that I want to show here are the fracture of, uh, of hard metals. In principle, you can do this also for ceramic, which is also size dependent. The fracture strength. And the same is also true for, for hard metals. Uh, Despite that they, they are uh, metal binders and uh, a mixture of, uh, of ductile and uh, so uh, the semi brittle behavior in principle. So, what we have done is we have measured the ductility, the strength and ductility of different sample sizes. And what you see here, this is the largest samples, and you see the volume of the, sample, of the tested uh, material. Uh, and in this, this is about 10 millimeter, uh, 8 or, or 9 millimeter diameter and the length of 9 millimeter. So the volume is 10 to the 12 cubic microns and the smallest sample has a few cubic microns. This is this sample. So that's really huge if you simply want if you, you really want to reflect what happens in, in this material, you have to machine 10 to the 12 of these, these samples in order to get really the same result. <coughs> okay, and then here are some samples in between. And now you can look what happens. Uh, so the fracture strain of the largest sample is only somewhat more than 2,000 uh, to gigapascal. Yes? Uh, when we go to this banding sample where the high stress volume is significantly smaller, we have done, or the student has done a lot of experiments, you see you get a, a broad variation of the fracture strength between uh, yes, somewhat 3 gigapascal and 4 gigapascal. If you further reduce the size to the typical dimension which are used for drillers of, uh, for microelectronic devices, where most of these special hard metals are used, then it is shifted to even uh, higher strength values. And when we go, we have here tested several of them, they are more uh, they are more straight here and they have uh, nearly no or nearly uh, very limited variation in, in, in strength and the fracture strength goes up to about 6 gigapascal. So we have really a, a variation of the strength simply by the volume strength of 6 gigapascal. And oh, that's approximately visible what happens. In the large volume, you see some, some center pores. 
in, this, in the order of few microns. And therefore, you have this relative small fracture toughness, well, or this relative small strength in this uh, uh, 4 gigapascal this uh, drilling uh, uh, like samples size, sam size samples we have a, a relative small defect typically in the order of 500 to ma uh, nanometer to maximum one micro, yes? See here from different samples where the crack starts. Here, this is one micron, the other one is five, somewhat more than 500. In these very tiny samples, we can find no defect. There are, so the, the, the only scatter is caused by maybe the largest uh, tungsten carbide uh, particle, or maybe the, the interface between the, the cobalt, which is it is not clear what really dominate or oh, cause the fracture in this, the plasticity, and then the piling up of the dislocation at the interface, uh, or between the cobalt uh, and the tungsten carbide, and even as really a small amount of plasticity is really visible even in this defect-free material. So, now I make, we make a, a break of 10 minutes and then we continue. We come to the last point. It is the fracture mechanics of thin film and layer. This is a, a part where one could, could talk I think two days, yes. And it is really important, yes. Industrially, extremely important, yes. Because mm, you, there are so many components which fail, uh, but there, this problem is much more difficult than what we have discussed before. But for the pure physical consideration of the, of the problems, we have to do the same classification. Is it the ideal brittle, semi brittle feature, or tactile feature? That's the reason why I have introduced used a small uh, introduction to this area. Okay. In 10 minutes, we see us again.